Good morning, everybody. Okay, I can't let this go. Happy April Fool's Day. <laughs> yeah, <laughs> I, I normally take this day off and turn it over to the amateurs, <laughs> but uh, because I consider myself a pro fool, some people may say I'm an expert fool, but uh, so I have to work today. But my name is Ron Franz. I'm the coordinator for the Christopher C. Gibbs College of Architecture's Environmental Design Program, and also have the roles as a small towns coordinator for the Institute for Quality Communities and as an associate professor with the Division of Architecture. It's the longest title I'll ever have in my life. Put that on a business card. The Environmental Design Program is one of four undergraduate programs in the Gibbs College of Architecture. We probably could be called the Community Design Program as well. Our students study uh, placemaking, tactical urbanism, walkability, bikeability, historic preservation, and community revitalization. Currently, we have 45 cool, kind, engaged students in our program who represent an incredibly diverse enrollment, and many of them are here today. But today, my role is to introduce the first speaker of the day, Kennedy Smith. I first met Kennedy about this time of the year, back in 1986. So if I'm doing the math right, that's 33 years ago, right? 34 years ago? Okay, <laughs> we're getting our numbers together. Okay, 33, which could also be considered a third of a century ago. Yeah. <laughs> so anyway, we've known each other a long time. She came here to the Oklahoma Department of Economic and Community Affairs, which is now the Department of Commerce. We selected the first five Main Street towns, Alva, Anadarko, Duncan, Okmulgee, and Tahlequah. And that program still continues with a staff and a network of over 30 communities all over the state. Over the past 30 years, we've worked together in, each, in a variety of ways. We've talked about uh, conference things that we've seen happen, bizarre things that happen to speakers and things, so hopefully nothing happens today. Uh, but she continues to do things with Main Street revitalization all over the country. Kennedy Smith is one of the nation's foremost experts on commercial district re revitalization, downtown economics, and independent business development. After 19 years of experience on the staff of the National Main Street Center, including 14 years as a director, Kennedy co-founded the Community Land Use Plus Economics Group in 2004. It's also known as CLU. Her work focuses part, uh, particularly attention on cultivating locally owned businesses, creating dynamic retail development strategies, creating effective business and property development incentives, finding new uses for key historic buildings, and strengthening the organizational infrastructure needed to create vibrant town centers. Kennedy's work's been recognized nationally. Planet, Planet Citizen, our Planet Citizen, uh, named her as one of the 100 most influential urbanists of all time in 2017, and one of the top 100 urban thinkers in 2009. Fast Company Magazine named her one of the 50 champions of innovation, and in 2004, the National Trust for Historic Preservation honored her with its President's Award. So at this time, I'd like to welcome Kennedy Smith, and she said, I need to shoot a t-shirt cannon at her to get her attention when she needs to stop speaking. So if you see me run across or do something in front of this, I am uh, trying to get her attention. So thank you very much. And uh, you have till 1040, and I'll give you a notice, okay? Okay, thank you. My lavalier just fell out, so I'm going to stand here at the podium and, uh, and speak. So today is uh, April Fool's Day, and if you know Ron Franz like I do, I thought for sure there was going to be quite the April Fool's introduction. So I have one for him instead. Um, uh, Ron and I share a, uh, a funny bone for... Um, weird business combinations. When you travel around and work in main streets, you see the strangest combinations of businesses. Um, you know, you know that the Gap sells kind of clothes, you know, McDonald's sells kind of hamburgers. But in downtowns, you come across things like Fluff 'em, Buff 'em, and Stuff 'em, which was a combination auto detailing hair salon taxidermy in Canyon City, Colorado. <laughs> And I just found, found another one. Um, this one's for you. It's a combination plasma center laundromat. These are special places that we create here in America on Main Streets. 
And I thought Ron would uh, appreciate that one. <laughs> yeah, what's the address? I'm going, going right there. Sounds a little unsanitary to me. Um, so, you know, you can, you can have great public spaces where people hang out and sit in rocking chairs. You can have great crosswalks and you can have, you know, haiku on your lamp posts. Um, those are all nice things that enliven the public environment and help create quality communities. But it really is the places people congregate, the businesses that help create the personality, reflect the personality of a community and that you experience um, on the first floor, ground floor level, and that really draw you into a place. And it's important to get a balance of, you know, reflecting what the personality of the community is and the businesses and having that come out on the street and really reflect a place's um, uh, values and, and sense of humor and uh, direction. Um, and I love independently owned businesses, uh, especially if they're in downtowns. I just love them to death. They create a real sense of uh, flavor um, that helps you understand a place and its people and what they're like uh, in a way that nothing else does. I started out actually intending to be an architect and made it through three and a half years of grad school uh, in architecture and then decided that's not really what I wanted to do. My parents weren't too happy about that little shift, but um, I, I was in Charlottesville, Virginia. I'd gone to the University of Virginia and um, the downtown by the time I got out of graduate school was essentially dead. They had built a um, pedestrian mall uh, plaza in the 1970s designed by Lawrence Halperin and uh, so it was a nice, nicely designed pedestrian mall. But Charlottesville used to have 50,000 cars driving down its main street every day. And with the pedestrian mall's construction, all of a sudden they were kind of limited, the businesses there, to the 5,000 people who worked downtown. They weren't getting that drive-through traffic, the exposure, the eyes on the street that they needed to, uh, to survive. So they had 35 vacant buildings. And I kind of wandered into downtown revitalization. There was a merchants association in place that had been there since the big first big shopping mall opened up. Um, and I ended up working with them, trying to understand what was happening uh, to the economics of the downtown, because it, it, it was such a complete shift from the healthy, vibrant place that we'd had forever. Um, it, um, 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 up until really the, the 1950s, 1960s, downtowns were where everybody went for everything. Um, you'd go there for shopping, you'd go there to socialize, you'd go there to sell things, you might go there to work. You would occasionally go to the next biggest town if you needed to get something special that you couldn't get locally. But downtown was where uh, social life and cultural life was really based. Then in the 1950s, bad stuff started to happen to downtowns. We didn't know what it was at the time, but it was kind of a combination of things that came together all at the same time, like the advent of credit cards, which made it possible for people to spend more money than they actually should uh, on buying things. Um, Euclidean zoning, which divided out separate sections of the community, so you could have shopping mall here, and industrial park here, and affordable housing here, and expensive housing there. Um, you know, kind of tearing apart the, the mixed-use blend that we'd had for years. The advent of the interstate highway system of 1956, which is now 46,000 miles long and um, cost $83 billion a year to maintain and makes it really easy for people to travel farther, longer distances, to go shopping or to go to work or to visit something or somebody. Um, uh, things like accelerated depreciation, which provided great tax write-offs, tax benefits, for uh, investors who invested in commercial development. They could write off their investment in uh, only, say, say, seven or 10 years instead of the uh, 39 and a half it usually takes for commercial real estate. That pumped hundreds and hundreds and hundreds of millions of dollars into commercial development in the 1960s and 1970s. And sure enough, all these things kind of happened, and before you knew it, we had people moving uh, farther away from town centers into suburban areas like this one and like that one. Um, and as people moved out to the burbs, retail followed them, uh, because retail is a, it's kind of a parasitic industry. It, 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 um, um, uh, it's a follower, not a leader. It goes where people are and it kind of puts itself in their path. So the first retail that moved out to the burbs was convenience-oriented stuff like fast food and groceries and gasoline, dry cleaning. Um, but it wasn't too long before we began to get regional enclosed shopping centers which um, were really just based on apparel and apparel sales. If you think about early shopping centers, 95% of what they offered was uh, clothing, shoes, jewelry, accessories. And what they would do basically is say, within a 30 mile uh, driving radius, we can attract X number of households who are gonna spend Y amount of money on clothing. So we're gonna try to get all of that into one building. Then we saw department stores and clothing stores in downtowns uh, start to close up because of that. And that began the whole uh, cycle of disinvestment. About 10 or 15 years later, these guys came along. Um, lest we forget, they began actually life as a 
independently owned mom and pop business in a downtown, so be careful what you wish for when you're starting your business. Um, and that killed a whole bunch of other downtown businesses, which, sim which, which simply couldn't compete with the volume of sales uh, that the big boxes were, were creating. Community leaders, seeing all this bad stuff start happening, tried to uh, fix things by jumping in with a bunch of interventions. Um, like thinking, oh, these old buildings downtown look so antiquated, we should make them look like these new monolithic um, aluminum buildings going up on the, in the suburbs. Let's cover them up. Uh, let's uh, you know, be really careful and attentive to our customers' needs. Uh, let's pay close attention to business placement <laughs> so that we're creating those dynamic, synergistic business clusters. Um, we did lots of stupid things, but eventually some communities lost faith and began tearing down buildings. And once they're gone, they're gone. You can't put that history uh, and that experience back. And between, between the construction of shopping malls and the construction of big box stores, we have vacancies all over the country in old buildings and uh, increasingly in uh, newer, newer, more recent ones. Um, what shopping malls did essentially was to take this piece uh, oh, can you see it? There we go, oh, very faintly. There's a little kind of faint piece there that's missing out of the pie. That's the piece that shopping malls took. It's mostly apparel oriented and it's mostly middle price points. That's the market they went after. Big box stores, oh, it took a bigger chunk. The, my slide's not working, I'm sorry. But big box stores took a big piece out uh, that kind of goes like this on that graph. Um, and that it, and, and um, I'm making it almost impossible for an independently owned business to compete in the categories where they have uh, dominance. What we were doing in essence was creating more retail space than we had retail dollars to support. In 1960, there were four square feet of retail space per person in the US. They're now about 41.7 square feet per person. Um, we can only support um, about half of that and the worldwide average is only about, uh, about four square feet per person. So we're way overbuilt. We have 10 times the amount of commercial space, retail space, than we can actually support with our, with our dollars. Um, another way to look at that is uh, in uh, 1950, uh, the, trade, the retail trade area of the average small town in the US was about 15 miles. That was as far as somebody would travel to go shopping or to go to work. Um, and so I took just a piece sort of north of Oklahoma City off of a map last night and I put these 15 mile radii around them and you see that there's not a whole lot of overlap. Uh, communities naturally for centuries and centuries have evolved about a day's business travel away from each other and so it kind of works out that way. Now the average retail trade area for the average small town in the US is 50 miles. People are willing to travel 50 miles uh, to shop. So if you take one of those 15 mile radii, expand it to 50 miles, that's what you have now. In essence, you've got communities that are cannibalizing one another for exactly the same retail dollars instead of differentiating themselves um, in, a, in a kind of logical pattern. And in the process of doing this, this is the kind of retail environment that we've created. If I didn't tell you that this was Lynchburg, Virginia, you wouldn't know because it looks just like Lawrence, Kansas and Frederick, Maryland uh, and every other place across the country that has created this kind of commercial sprawl. Drop in Missouri, blessed with three Walmart stores. Um, I, I flew into Oklahoma City yesterday and I spent a few minutes driving around and photographing some of my favorite fast food places. Can you tell which of these is in Oklahoma City? Well, the one in the top is. The other one is in Quincy, Massachusetts. How about this? Which Olive Garden is in Oklahoma City? The one in the top. The other one's in Harrisonburg, Virginia. Um, which of these is in Oklahoma City? They look exactly alike. You can't tell the difference. This J. Crew is in Annandale, Virginia. It looks the same as the one in Calgary, Ontario. This uh, Gap Kids is in Metuchen, New Jersey. It looks exactly the same as the one in Yerevan, Armenia. Um, they look exactly the same. I photoshopped out the name of the business and the logo. Do you know what it is? What is it? What's that one? What's that one? What's that one? Isn't that creepy? It's like... <laughs> You know, these buildings have become part of a corporate branding system and we're letting these corporations scatter their logos up and down the roads coming into our towns. It, it has always blown my mind that we take such great care to protect the design of our historic districts, of the downtowns and historic neighborhoods, and we apparently don't care what the heck happens out on the, um, the, the outskirts and the roads uh, leading into town. It's kind of crazy. So. Um, retail is going through some major, major transformations. If you read the newspapers, listen to the news, you've seen that the retail apocalypse is upon us and then you've got some commercial real estate companies saying, no, no, it's not really that bad. But actually, it kind of really is that bad. We're losing a lot of national retail chains. Um, I mean, maybe that's not bad. I shouldn't be saying bad, but it's big, let's say. Um, lots of the businesses that we have known for a long time have 
um, gone out of business in recent years, uh, in the past few years. In part, this is because um, they were overextended. They, they expanded too quickly and didn't have the capital to really support that level of expansion. Um, but the larger part is it's finally just caught up with us. Um, people are spending a little bit less on retail these days, especially millenniums. I'll talk about that in a second. Um, are spending a little, bit, uh, a little bit less on retail. And internet shopping is beginning to take its toll. It currently only accounts for about 9% of retail sales, but that's you know, enough to uh, cut into a business's profit margin. Um, and malls are being demolished all over the country. This is something that we used to predict, thinking that far off day will come when shopping malls begin to disappear. Actually, there are about uh, um, 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 80, 80 shopping malls that are, that are being uh, deconstructed right now, the materials recycled, uh, and about 250 disappeared in the past three years across the country. Um, retail stats are really pretty scary right now. Losses from 314 loans secured by failing shopping malls totaled $1.68 billion uh, the, at the um, um, uh, beginning part of 2016. The average U.S. household owns 300,000 things. Only 3% of all the children in the world live in the U.S., but they own 40% of all the kids' toys and books. The average American will spend 3,680 hours looking for misplaced phones, keys, sunglasses, and other things over the course of his or her lifetime. That equals 153 days. The average American home has increased in size almost threefold since 1950, while the average American household itself uh, has dropped in size to uh, 2.5. And even though we have bigger houses, 10% uh, of American households rent off-site storage. Off-site storage is the fastest growing sector of the commercial real estate industry. We have 7.3 square feet of off-site storage space per capita in the US. The average American woman has 30 outfits. In 1930, the average American woman had nine. Americans throw away an average of 68 pounds of clothes each annually, not recycled, just thrown away. There are more televisions than people in the US. We have more shopping centers than high schools. Personal consumption has soared and continues to soar. We spend $1.2 trillion annually on non-essential things like marshmallow peeps, I don't know, things we don't really need. Um, it equals 11.2% of our total consumer spending, it's stuff that we're probably gonna throw away in a few months. Um, in 1950, non-essential retail spending accounted for only 4%. We just have too much stuff. We spend more on jewelry and shoes than on higher education. 47% of Ameri American households have no savings. We're facing a real retail crisis, and it's playing out. I mean, I hate to be kind of evil like this, but it's playing out in the shopping mall industry, and downtowns are beginning to actually thrive because that's what people actually want and are looking for. The national retail chains have homogenized products, um, they've overextended themselves, and they're beginning to close their doors, and unfortunately all of us are going to pay the price in some ways in terms of vacant shopping centers and deteriorating land values, but um, things are beginning to turn around. The millennials are playing a big, a big role in this. Um, they dine and shop out more than other age cohorts, but they spend 27% less than Generation X, one generation ahead of them. 70% um, of, of, of millennials um, shopping takes place in bricks and mortar stores. Uh, they like locally owned businesses. Um, they're much more inclined than their parents are to repair things rather than throw them away. Um, they repurpose things. These are these guys who take old luggage and turn them into uh, boom boxes and speakers. Um, they're very much into the sharing economy. They like um, used, used things, clothing, housewares furniture and prefer those in many ways uh, over new things. Um, and manufacturers are responding. This is a, a manufacturing company in the UK uh, that makes men's clothing that's designed to last for multiple generations. So uh, every, every piece of clothing has a tag in it that has a blank where you can write in the name of the first owner and the date he acquired it, then the second owner and the date he acquired it, and the third owner, so that the clothing itself kind of develops this patina of history um, over time. Um, manufacturers are beginning to encourage their own customers to repair things rather than replace them. Patagonia has a huge campaign now about don't, don't buy a new Patagonia jacket, instead repair it, and they show you how online. They give you instructions for doing so, or you can send your jacket back to them for repair and they'll send it back to you as a way of cutting down the amount of stuff in landfills and beginning to rein in this kind of out-of-control out consumer culture that we've had for a number of years. Millennials prefer shopping in locally owned businesses. Um, 
lots of things are beginning to change that cycle of uh, massive retail consumption that we've had. And as you can imagine, it's going to have a pre pretty significant impact on the kind of commercial development that takes place or redevelopment that takes place in the years ahead. Um, independently owned businesses are are, are fabulous for communities. They do things that national retail chains simply cannot. Um, they, uh, they're they're um, unresponsive to local markets. This is a business that popped up not too far from where I live. I live uh, in Arlington County, Virginia, just outside uh, Washington. I live in the neighborhood that Amazon is coming to. That's my neighborhood, um, for better or for worse. But the stores there are beginning to respond. So this is a store that was a traditional furniture store for many years. Now that people are living in smaller apartments, they're advertising small-scale furniture, and they're beginning to build furniture and source furniture that's a little bit tinier and fits better into um, that floor plan. Their their um, uh, independently owned businesses are responsive to customer needs. This is a, one of those hardware stores where it's packed to the gills, you know, it, floor to ceiling, wall to wall, and you walk in, and they know where every single thing is in there, and you don't have to buy a package of a dozen bolts. You can buy the one that you need. Um, that's the kind of thing that you can get from locally owned businesses. Fab fabulous customer service. This is a business I came across in uh, Winter Haven, Florida, where it's, a, it's an antique store, but they have this little framed thing on the floor that says, men, welcome, come on into our man cave. And in the back, they have this room that has a big screen TV and you know popcorn and magazines. The guys can sit there and um, you know, veg out while their wives are shopping. Uh, yes, we ship. Um, they independently owned businesses can sell niche products that the big stores aren't going to uh, notice. They can fill in gaps in the market that the community might want. Um, things that you're not going to get anyplace else. Where else can you get a cart to go? Um, unusual products. This is a business that that uh, repurposes uh, canvas sails from uh, sailing ships in Maine and turns them into uh, bags and uh, gifts. And they give you unique experiences, things that you're just not going to find in a big store or a national chain um, that connect you to the community and have a little fun. This is a business that I really love. This is in Des Moines, Iowa. It's a Thai restaurant called Taste of Thailand. And tapping into the fact that Iowa is the first state that has the, the presidential caucuses, what did they do? They went and they got a voting booth, an old-fashioned voting booth, and uh, the kind that has the lever that you pull and the curtain draws, draws forward. And they have a, um, a different question every week. And it can, they're stupid questions. It's like, you know, Will Angelina Jolie take Brad Pitt back again? And people like flock there to vote on this question of the week. And, uh, and then every week the Des Moines Register has a little box where they run the results of the Taste of Thailand's poll of the week. So, um, but man, it gets people in. It is a, it is a crazy thing. Um, this is uh, one of my favorite businesses I've seen in recent years. This is in a, uh, a neighborhood outside Boston. And this is a bodega, a, you know, a sort of Latino grocery store. Nothing special about the outside of it. Um, you go inside and it looks like a bodega. It's kind of messy and the clerks aren't really paying attention to you. Um, but in the corner of it, uh, if you see back in that little nook back there, there's a Snapple juice machine. And on the floor, in front of the Snapple juice machine, there's a brass button in the floor. And when you press on that brass button, step on it, the door of the Snapple juice machine slowly opens. And behind it, as you walk through it, is a men's clothing store called Bodega. So. The bodega in front, which actually functions as a bodega, is simply a front for the men's clothing store. Um, they sell, they sell high-end athletic shoes and clothing. Um, there it is. And they're doing $1,800 a square foot in sales, which is like rivaling what Barney's does. I mean, just phenomenal sales. They do no advertising. It's all word of mouth. People love the experience of going there, hitting that button, and walking through the Snapple juice machine to go into this incredible store. You're not going to find that in a national retail chain. These are the kinds of things that only independently owned businesses can do. So if you want a quality community, it is really, really important to cultivate locally owned businesses and make sure that they really do reflect the kind of place, the kind of place you're trying to create and uh, reflect the personality of the community. Locally owned businesses um, give more back to the community than uh, national retail chains and certainly big boxes um, who source most of their products out of town uh, bank deposits um, um, often aren't even kept overnight in the community. Uh, locally owned businesses return 60 to 80 percent of their of their profits to the community itself, versus 40 percent for national chains and 20 percent for big boxes. Um, and they create community capital. I, I hear so many stories like this one. This is a bookstore um, outside San Diego, where this is this is the the the, the, the couple that owns it. Um, the wife got really really sick. And the husband had to close the bookstore for a while so that he could take care of her. One of his competitors in the next town over heard that he had to close the store. So what does he do? 
he opens it for him and runs it along with him, even though he's his competitor to keep the bookstore open. Um, a similar story, this is in a, another town in California. This is a donut shop. Um, this guy's wife also got sick, and he needed, he, he, he always wanted to spend as much time as there, with, with her as he could in the afternoon. Um, but to do that, he had to sell all of his donuts out early enough, and when his donuts were all sold out for the day, then he could go to the hospital. The word got out uh, in town, and everybody started queuing up at 6 in the morning to buy a dozen donuts each, so that by 7 o'clock in the morning, his donuts were sold out, and he could get to the hospital. Um, and then this one, this is from a, uh, a bookstore where they had to move down the block um, to a new location. So their customers all showed up en masse, 150 of them, and formed a big human bucket line and carried the books to the new bookstore. Over the course of a couple of hours, the entire bookstore got relocated. Because their customers loved them so much. They just loved them and wanted to help. Um, there are five things I wanted to mention about creating uh, a quality environment in which uh, retailers can thrive, where you, if you have a policy role, if you simply are an outspoken person in your community, you can begin to influence how commercial development happens. Um, there, there are five things I think are important. The first is not to permit development of more commercial space than your community can realistically support. It seems like a basic kind of idea, um, but practically every community in the country has violated that over the past 50 years. Um, and all it takes is a little bit of math to figure out how much can we realistically support. It's not complicated stuff here. Um, and places are taking note of that. About 10 or 15 years ago, the state of Maine passed a law that said, if you want to develop a new commercial building that is larger than 50,000 square feet, you must first hire a market analyst to demonstrate that there's enough market demand to support a new 50,000 square feet of commercial space in this community. So. 50,000 square feet can't be displacing sales from existing businesses. It has to be new demand. Um, the developer has to pay for the market study, but the local city council gets to choose the market analyst to do it. So it really is kind of a blind, a blind process. Is there a way to cut down on sprawl that's going to ultimately hurt uh, the quality and the economics of the community? Um, second is to encourage development of businesses that create things um, more than just businesses that distribute things. Retail businesses are distributive businesses versus businesses that create. And here's one of the kind of funny things, is we've always had these businesses in downtowns. We've always had these sort of small industries that are making things. My uh, partner and I, he's in Philadelphia and I'm in Arlington, for the past, I don't know, three or four years, we've been going through Sanborn fire insurance maps um, that show you over time what businesses were in what locations, what uses were in what locations, among other things. They also obviously tell you the building materials and the building size and shape and stuff. But we've been doing these tallies of um, downtowns and their uses at the time that those downtowns were sort of at their peak performance, which was generally in the 1940s or early 1950s, when they were kind of hitting on all cylinders, what was the business composition of that downtown? What percentage Average percentage use was retail, would you guess, when downtowns were at their peak of performance? 75%? 50? Anything else? 25? 17. 17%. We think for some reason that they were all retail. I think it's because we've had a couple of generations that have grown up with shopping malls and we kind of think that when you have a commercial center it's all gonna be retail. But in reality, it wasn't. It was hotels, it was restaurants, it was small manufacturers, it was offices. The, 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 the storefront spaces were lively. You felt like there was activity going on in there, but they weren't necessarily retail spaces. And that's been a big revelation to us. But when you look around, you see all of these businesses still there. Um, whether it's shoe repair, HVAC businesses, porcelain crystal repair, woodworking. Um, this guy makes uh, uh, handmade weather vanes and sells them all over, the, all over the world. Distilleries, all these sort of maker businesses. This is a guy who makes custom clothing in uh, West Des Moines, Iowa. This guy I just love, he makes, his name is William Reese and he makes um, handmade concert and Celtic harps. He's in downtown um, Rising Sun, Indiana. Um, Pretty much everybody in Rising Sun who needs a concert harp has bought one by now. Um, his customers aren't really local. Um, they find him you know, online all over the world by word of mouth. Um, he has no local customers, but it is so fabulous having that business downtown because you hear this harp music wafting out the door and down the street and you're kind of drawn to it. And he loves showing people what he does. So you see somebody looking at the storefront window and he invites you in and he shows you how he makes the harps and he sells these t-shirts in the front for the 
people who are curious to come in and say, love a harpist, there are only 102 strings attached. And um, uh, completely location neutral business. He could be located any place in the country or probably in the world, but he wanted to be there because he liked Rising Sun, he liked the downtown district, it fit his personality, um, it was affordable, and he could sell his stuff from any place. We have this thing called the internet now, and it makes it possible for businesses to sell anything from anywhere, which makes it very liberating for, in, for independently owned businesses to really uh, be able to blow the doors off their former markets um, and do well. We need to create tools and incentives to cultivate and support independently owned businesses uh, and to help them grow over time. Um, you can take a passive approach and just hope that the right entrepreneur with the right idea comes through town and sets up the right kind of business, um, or you can be more aggressive. And lots of communities are creating co-working spaces and maker spaces uh, to encourage that to happen, to provide people with the space to do things. This is a, a specialized co-working space in Omaha called Bench. It's a woodworking space. Um, they have co uh, specialized co-working sewing places now and uh, writing spaces so that people who kind of do things on, on, on the side have a place to do them and really grow their business. Um, one of the things that you'll notice if you look at the 2010 and 2000 census is that the number of people who work full-time from a home-based business in 2010 is 40% greater than it was in 2000. And part of that is because of the economic downturn uh, in the late 2000s, um, and people had to kind of work um, um, and work on their own. But instead of that number sort of, you know, bouncing back up now that people are you know, back and employed, it continues to grow because more people are thinking, yeah, I like working for myself. If we can get more of those businesses out of their homes and into a downtown place, uh, the better for the district as well as the, the people. This is a business that's a full-time um, pop-up business. They basically try out businesses for three months, and at the end of three months, the business either uh, decides, yeah, this works, and I'm going to rent my own storefront space, or they just go and do another concept. It's called grand opening. Um, and here it was when it was a cafe, and here it was when it was a, an auction house, and uh, here it was when it was a, a bingo, I mean a, 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 a ping pong parlor. Um, every three months, it's a new business concept. This one I really love. This is kind of a floating um, pop-up store called Cookie Bar. They, they, they're never in the same place twice. They have this, their sign is one of these like printed on vinyl, clear vinyl peel-off things. So they just put it on whatever the storefront is of the day that they're located in. It's this mother and son who make these cookies. And one day they might be in a hair salon, one day they might be in a gym, one day they might be in an insurance agency. And you see people in the morning kind of like scrambling around because they sell out fast. They sell out within like 10 minutes, 15 minutes, running on the street. Where's Cookie Bar today? Where's Cookie Bar today? I have the town madness. Um, there are lots of ways to capitalize businesses now that didn't exist a few years ago so that you don't have to wait for the, right, the person with the right business idea who also has a reserve of money on hand and who can uh, run a business well uh, that meets your community's needs to do it. You can kind of put it together. Uh, because of the, uh, the, the Jobs Act, um, we uh, jumpstart our small businesses. Um, act, we have the ability to crowdfund in a more uh, uh, sort of structured way. Um, crowdfunding has been around for five or six years in the U.S. as it is. This is a business in Oakland, California called Sweet Bar that was trying to get started by raising about $20,000. There's their um, Kickstarter campaign. Their goal was $20,000. They raised $21,000. Basically, by selling things like the naming rights to to uh, to muffins and menu items, so for you know 50 bucks you can be the the the, the Ron Franz muffin or the you know whatever. I'm not sure. I don't. I'm not, I'm not going to go down that road. We could get very creative, but I, I won't do that. Um, but with the Jobs Act, uh, there's a real structured way. People, depending on what their their annual income and their net worth is, can invest basically between a thousand and ten thousand dollars a year in a locally owned independently owned business. Um, the business can raise between 100000 and a million, depending on what level of scrutiny they, they want from the IRS, um, to help support that business. So you can help businesses grow and expand, or you can help create new businesses. So if you have somebody with a great entrepreneurial idea who lacks the cash, the community can put together the money to make that happen and get that business established. Um, the Atlantic, the other side of the Atlantic has a lot more experience with, with, uh, with crowdfunding than we do. And if you look at a, a website called Crowdcube in the UK, they've been ahead of us for three or four years on this. And you'll see some really fabulous businesses, um, many of them downtown businesses that have been funded by communities in the UK. This is a Hebridean food company. Um, this one is a, a haberdasher called the Village Haberdashery. And there's the actual store. It's, it's a downtown women's dress store. Um, completely owned by people in the community and run by somebody who had a good entrepreneurial idea. And there are all kinds of variations on crowdfunding. This is in Port, Port Washington, Wisconsin. Um, 
there was a building that had a kind of, it was like a, an older building, I wouldn't call it greatly historic with a capital H, but it was a nice older building that had a restaurant that people loved in it, and the guy who owned the building um, wanted to tear the building down. He didn't want he didn't need to maintain it anymore. People were alarmed about this. So this group of people got together and formed their own LLC, called it Renew Port Holdings, to raise money from the community selling shares of stock for 500 bucks. They bought the building, stabilized the restaurant, and it's gone so well they've been able to raise enough capital that they're now creating other businesses and actually doing some infill construction. This is a cafe they created, and this is an, an infill building with um, ground floor uh, commercial space and upper floor housing. Uh, there's one of the housing units um, upstairs overlooking the port. All done with community capital because people wanted to see a better, a better place. Um, this is kind of a hard map to see, but there's also a new program called Opportunity Zones. Everybody heard of Opportunity Zones? It kind of came out of the blue in the, um, in the, uh, the, tax, the tax Cut Act uh, last year, but basically what it does is designate uh, about 25% of all of the qualified low and moderate income household census tracts in the U.S. as places where uh, people who have money locked up in investment funds of various kinds now, it could be invested in a mutual fund or it could be invested in artwork, but they're not selling whatever that investment is because they don't want to pay the capital gains on it. Basically, this gives them a way to take that, take that property, sell it, roll it over into an opportunity fund that invests in one of these districts on business development, which can include property development, um, and in that way defer or completely uh, get rid of their capital gains um, at the end of the day. These funds are just beginning to come together, but there are already a number of downtowns across the country that are putting together their own opportunity funds to take advantage of that, to say, great, we have five business development priorities and six buildings that need substantial rehabilitation. We need to raise X amount of money. Opportunity funds, let's get this done. So if you've not explored this yet, I really encourage you to take a look at this. These are, this is a map of uh, sort of opportunity funds designated in sort of central Oklahoma area. Um, and you know, local local heroes can raise money too for businesses. This is in a town in Illinois, where they really needed another couple of restaurants downtown. And people said we could like kind of wait all day long for the right person to come to town, or we can just make it happen. So about a dozen friends got together, pooled their money, um, went to a, a culinary school in Chicago, a Culinary Institute of America, based there and um, hired a graduating chef, and his wife happened to be a restaurant manager, and set them up in this business called Firefly Grill. Um, there's, the, there's the chef. And what they're doing is telling them, you can, if you want to own this restaurant, over the course of 10 years, every year you can buy out the investment that we put into it, and then we'll take that capital and recycle it into a new business in the district. This is a Watertown, Maine, which has a tax increment finance pool of money for the downtown area, which they use for forgivable loans for their high priority business targets. They have a list of about a dozen businesses every year that they really would like to see come downtown. So if somebody has the skills to open one of those dozen priority businesses, they'll get a $50,000 forgivable loan and every year 20% of the principal owed is paid off. All they pay is the interest um, over that period of time. So over the course of five years, they basically have gotten a $50,000 grant for doing the business. And they've done sneaky things like written in requirements that they have to uh, change their window displays every, every, uh, every two weeks. Um, they have to be open 48 hours per week. So they're kind of doing the stuff that a shopping mall might do to get businesses to stay open um, for a longer period of time. Wildly successful. This is one of my favorite incentive programs for business development. This is from Winston-Salem, North Carolina. Um, they had a, a block of kind of derelict vacant buildings on the edge of the downtown that were being vandalized and the windows were being broken and they were being covered with graffiti. Not good graffiti. And uh, so what they thought was that they would um, uh, try to get a cluster of uh, seven to ten restaurants to locate there all at the same time. They went to established restaurateurs in the region and asked if they would open a new location here. Um, and the restaurant said, yeah, but we need, you know, it's expensive to start a restaurant. We have to pay for equipment and we have to pay for furnishings and it takes a while to build up a clientele. So the city took one and a half million dollars of its block grant money, it could have been any kind of grant money they had, um, went to a couple of local banks the local banks agreed to loan 70% of the money that the restaurateurs would need to start. They've had to put in 30% themselves. And then so the restaurateurs could borrow 70%, but here's the kicker. The city used its block grant money to pay off the loans for the first two years. It wasn't an outright grant. The restaurateurs had to pay it back at the end of the loan period, but it gave them two years of breathing room where they had no debt service at all to pay off. 
to get their restaurants established. And it's worked brilliantly. They got seven restaurants in there that are still there after um, 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 a decade in business. And communities are doing things like uh, making space available for uh, retail condominiums so that business owners can actually buy their spaces and not be priced out if um, ground floor uh, uh, prices escalate. It's important to, to kind of periodically go through your planning and zoning codes too and make sure that you're not creating undue hurdles for business development um, in downtowns. I was in a town in Massachusetts a few years ago, Lemonster, Massachusetts, and these uh, talking about downtown business development, this, this couple came up to me afterwards and they said, we have a business, we sell um, automotive sound systems. We sell, you know, radios and CD players and all those things, speakers and stuff. And we, um, we really wanted to be downtown because we wanted to have a showroom downtown. You got all these people downtown. It would be a great market for us. We don't do any of the installation on site. We have a little fleet of vans. And so the vans go to wherever the person is, your house or your office to do the installation so you don't have to leave your car at a shop for the day. So the installation is kind of location free, you know, it kind of wanders around. So they opened the showroom downtown, they were there for a week and going really, really well and the local code inspector comes and knocks on their door and says, I'm sorry, but the downtown is not zoned for automotive businesses. And they said, well, we're not, we're not in doing any of the installations here, they're all done off site. I don't care. The law says no automotive businesses. You're an automotive business. We're going to fine you $1,000 a day until you get out. So they had to move. Um, and those kinds of things are tucked into zoning codes all over the country. So, um, you know, take a good read uh, at, of those and see what you can, uh, we can find. Um, this has no bearing on anything, but I just think it's a cool story. Speaking of uh, regulations, this is in Cooperstown, New York. Uh, the town council passed a law saying no, no food trucks downtown. So this guy opened a restaurant called Food Truck. <laughs> I just love that, I love him. Um, we also have to, in this whole sort of realm of incentives and tools for independently owned businesses, we have to protect legacy businesses, the ones that really, when you, when you think about what one or two businesses would you really, really miss if it were no longer uh, in your community, um, and make sure that they're dealing with uh, ownership transitions, with changes in rents, um, with all kinds of things that might buffer older businesses over time, businesses that provide unique skills that you need in the community, um, that we're keeping an eye on those and making sure that they are uh, protected and around for new generations. Um, and that business owners are keeping, are keeping current on new technologies, that they're using social media, um, that they're using new distribution techniques. I love this, this is a, a yarn shop that realized they didn't have quite enough of a market in, their, in the community where they were based to, uh, to support a, a store. So two days a week they have a yarn truck that goes around to other communities and sells yarn. They just kind of go visit other communities to sell things. They're keeping track on things like, um, like in-store beacons. I love beacon technology. I, I think it is the coolest thing um, where when you walk into a store, a beacon, and you have to opt into this of course, but you, you opt in and say, yeah, I want to hear from the store. When you walk in, they know who you are and they say, here are the specials we have for you for today or if you do this, then we'll give you that or whatever. Um, stores can use this to actually count inventory and see what, what particular products people think are, are most interesting. Some people think it's a little bit creepy, but it doesn't seem any creepier to me than when I was a kid and I had this, you know, I bought all my clothes from this downtown kids clothing store. The couple that owned that had a file, an old card catalog, where they would have notes. So if my grandmother came in and said, what size does Kennedy wear now in shoes? They would say, oh, she's a seven, and she would know what size to buy. So um, it's, really, it's really no different than that. Um, here it is, we're walking to Trader Joe's and they're spotting you and telling you what you can, what you can do. Um, millennials use this a bit, but it's Gen Z, the ones who are coming after the millennials, who are really, really tied into beacon technology and are using it, it's like 75, 76% more likely that they'll buy something um, if they have a message coming to their smartphone about what's available. We need to care as much about the design of new mixed use and commercial development in our communities as we do about the community's historic places. I, I really don't understand this one, why we have all these rules and regulations and uh, design review processes that people have to go through in historic areas. I mean, I do understand that. What I don't understand is why we don't require exactly the same thing um, for new construction in the community. We really want to have great new construction that kind of taps into the DNA of the community, that really builds on the design traditions that the community has established over time and continues that so that we're not building this kind of crap every place. Um, you know, Walmart it, it thinks it kind of responds to design pressure, and here's an example of a Walmart that thought that it was responding to design pressure from the community. Do you know where this is? It could be any place.
place. It could be, it could be anywhere. It could be anywhere, yeah. Um, this one actually is in California, but it could be in Oklahoma. It could be in Virginia. Um, versus when you really put their feet to the fire, you can get this. This is a new Walmart. Uh, yeah, isn't that nice? And it's like mixed use. It's got housing in it. So it's not just taking up, you know, one story of a big piece of land, but they're getting uh, maximum uh, use from the site. We really need to insist that national retailers uh, do a better job. Um, this is a, uh, an old shopping center not too far from where I live. This is in Arlington County, Virginia. It was just a drive-through strip shopping center in the 1950s and 1960s. And over the course of 20 years, the county really worked hard to transform this place. So they began with the easy, the easy projects, um, making the storefronts look better and the public amenities uh, be better. Um, they worked on getting a better uh, mix of locally owned businesses uh, in there. Um, and then they eventually began infill construction there, uh, kind of filling in the blocks and building up with uh, two and three floor units with housing and now with some, e some, some, some even taller units, some four and five story uh, buildings there so that they have housing clustered right there. They have a new bus transit center there. Um, they have a theater and a library branch there to turn it into a true community, transforming this place that you would have driven past 20 years ago and not even blinked an eye. It would have looked so commonplace. And now it's become a really kind of special place. And finally, we need to bring the energy uh, and the creativity of independently owned businesses out into the public realm so that it spills out of the stores and onto the sidewalk. I really think of storefront windows as theater, as street sidewalk theater. Um, and you can have really fascinating things in storefront windows. Even if a business isn't a, a traditional retailer, this is an optometrist who put these blinkies um, in the windows so that when you walk by, you see them all winking at you as you walk by. Um, this is a, uh, a realtor. I am driven uh, to uh, fits of anger when I walk past a, 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 a realtor's office and I see that the storefront window is covered with these eight and a half by 11 sheets of paper that have profiles of homes that are for sale and the whole window is coated with them. It's like, what? This is like just so ugly and it's so overwhelming. Um, this is a guy who took some digital picture frames and soldered them together and has them on timers so that different pictures of houses that are available show up at different times. And um, the one in the middle is touch sensitive, so if you press it, then all the stats on the house, its address and its price and its square footage show up. It's just a much more uh, appealing uh, way to, uh, to market homes. This is um, a favorite of mine too. I like, uh, I like uh, motion technology. This is a, a vacant storefront. Um, and they wanted to, A, mask the vacancy, and B, market a men's clothing brand that a downtown retailer was selling. So what they did was they, they have a scrim inside the storefront window. The storefront is just empty behind it. Um, and a, a projector like the one we have here in the, in the theater. Um, and they had this guy do these acrobatic jumps um, against a green screen. They recorded him, and it's, on, it's being run from a computer. There's a little heat sensor outside on the sidewalk. And so when somebody walks by, it picks up the heat and it activates the, uh, the storefront window. Some people walk by, don't even notice it. Some people walk by and stay there for an hour, kind of playing with it, wondering what the heck is going on. Um, and so here's how it, here's the guy inside filming it. I mean, we, 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 we could like literally do that with the stuff we have in this room right now, if we have an acrobat. Um, and there's the layout of the sidewalk, the heat sensor, um, the DVR that's playing it all, uh, the projector, and the computer. Um, very simple kind of thing to do. I saw a, a local um, ballet company use the same technology once. They had a big spot painted on the sidewalk that said stand here. And so you stand there, and if you go like this, a ballerina runs across the window this way. And if you go like that, she runs across the window this way. If you go like this, three or four of them come and they jump up in the air. Um, and, it, and it was a way for, for them to promote their, their um, um, a new season coming up and a way to mask a vacant storefront space downtown. And there was a line all the way down the block for hours and hours, people wanting to stand there and just make these ballerinas jump up and down. Um, this is a cool thing, uh, sort of stepping outside of storefront windows um, and into uh, sidewalks. This is um, in Nashville, where obviously it's a music city. They've, in the downtown core, they've wrapped their um, traffic switching boxes, which have elect um, 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 electricity in them, wrap them with vinyl uh, prints of Nashville recording artists, and on the back of them they have this little directional speaker. So as you walk past it, you hear this little blast of music um, from that recording artist, really cementing the fact that you're in uh, a music city. This is in uh, the UK. This is a, a town that um, everybody kind of joked about how everybody would say, are we going to have a white Christmas this year? No, we're not going to have a white Christmas this year. Well, th this, this one company decided we're going to actually make a white Christmas. 
So they have this Make Rivington Street Snow promotion where they put snow cannons on the tops of five buildings over the street, um, and you dial this phone number on your cell phone, and it activates, there's the top of the building, and you can see, this is all done with um, a simple kind of Arduino thing uh, and an API that you can download online. And so when somebody calls the number, it makes snow happen. So, so you too can have a white Christmas in Oklahoma. Um, fun, easy, smart ways to make the street come alive and make it be a very special, special kind of place. Um, a quick uh, case study of a place that I think has done a really great job at bringing the energy of uh, the businesses in the district out into the public realm. This is the, the Playhouse District in downtown Pasadena, California. Downtown Pasadena is, is kind of large and sprawly, and they've kind of, it's kind of divided into four smaller districts. The Playhouse District um, has the Playhouse Theater, which is a famous theater in California. People like Lucille Ball got their start there um, uh, in acting. Um, but the activity is very locked up inside it. They have a cooking school, they have a couple of museums, but their buildings are kind of fortress-like buildings, and unless you knew there was something creative going on in there, you probably wouldn't know there was something creative going on. So they thought, we need to get this creative activity out into the streets. So they did things like they got a, a, a design motif from one of their museums um, and decided to paint, to use that design motif to paint the side, the, the, the um, crosswalks. That was kind of step one. That was popular. Then the Playhouse Theater was like, hey, we could do outdoor productions. So they started doing outdoor performances um, in the downtown. They had a competition to select an artist to do uh, vinyl wraps around their traffic switching boxes. They've done this every, um, um, every year for the past three or four years. That was version one. Version two was a, a free speech promotion that they did. There's the Main Street manager standing with them, or Linda Romo with one of them. They uh, ended up having a sort of a big table event for, to, 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 to showcase the cooking school and downtown restaurants where they sold tickets for people to come eat at a big table on Green Street, a back street that they closed off. They had a thousand people show up the first year they did this. $75 tickets. They have an arts uh, festival with all kinds of fun things for kids to do. Um, they have a literature festival. And what I really like is they have this thing called High Neighbor where creative businesses in the downtown invite people who live there to come in and learn something. So this one, here example, is a, um, a smartphone photography uh, workshop that a, a bookstore and a camera store was doing. And even the church in the neighborhood kind of wanted, wanted to get in on this. They were like, hey, all this activity down the street, we want to be cool too. So they got these um, solar lights and uh, arranged them in the front of the church so that they're on these undulating lines that gradually sort of peak towards the door of the church. And so they come on at night and glow in the, in the uh, um, um, otherwise unused front lawn of the church. Very creative and really has changed the atmosphere and environment of the, uh, of the district. Um, Independently owned businesses are just amazing things. They can do things that uh, really tell the story of your community and help make it the kind of place that people want to live in and want to visit. Um, and I encourage you to, uh, to be creative in thinking about those concepts and thinking about ways that you can support and cultivate development of those businesses and grow them. Um, and make your downtowns and your neighborhood commercial districts be the kinds of places that you really uh, want them to be, to be quality communities. Thank you very much. Okay, thank you very much, Kennedy. That was very inspirational for getting us going, so thank you very much. Kennedy has to leave right after this. I believe she's headed to Richmond, Virginia, and then Yellowknife Northwest Territories, and Dylan can probably tell us where that is later.